named Vienna by the Sea and the City of Coffee are just a few nicknames used to describe Trieste. Gorgeous, aristocratic and distinctly cosmopolitan, this small city in the far northeastern corner of Italy checks all the boxes for curious travellers. And while Trieste may not be at the top of your Italy bucket list, after watching this video on the best things to do in Trieste, you'll see why it's a real gem to explore. Trieste is a charming port city and the capital of the region Friuli Venezia Giulia. Located just 8 kilometers or 5 miles from Slovenia and 30 kilometers or 19 miles from Croatia, Trieste is beautifully framed by a landscape of cliffs, karstic plateaus and lush greenery. Plus, it boasts a border town character that makes it truly unique. The thing with Trieste is, is that it's quite different from the image of Italy you're used to, and that alone makes it worth visiting. The city wasn't always Italian. In fact, Trieste spent most of its history under the Habsburgs and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, 600 years to be precise, from the late 14th to the early 20th centuries, with some brief interruptions in between. To help you plan your trip to Trieste, in addition to this video, I've also written a comprehensive Trieste travel guide, which includes more details about everything I'm about to share with you here, plus recommended tours, accommodation options, and there's a map indicating all the places and activities mentioned in this guide. I've shared a link to this guide in the description below this video. Now let's go and explore and experience the best things to do in Trieste. Andiamo, let's go! Ciao e benvenuti! Hello and welcome! My name is Michelle, I'm the Intrepid Guide, your guide to language learning for travel all by using my unique AT20 method. To find out more about my language courses, visit theintrepidguide.com. Now, if you're new to my channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button and click on the bell notification so you get an alert when I post more videos like this one. Now let's go and explore this gem right behind me. There's no doubt that Castello di Miramare or Miramare Castle should be on everyone's list of things to do when visiting Trieste. And for good reason. Although it lacks the ancient history that you'd expect from a castle, it only dates from the mid 1800s, this white fairy tale palace is a real beauty. So much so that it's often listed among Italy's most beautiful castles. The Miramare Castle sits on a cliff overlooking the Gulf of Trieste and it boasts epic sea views. With an eclectic blend of Gothic, medieval and Renaissance styles, it's very much in line with the fashion of the time it was built. Rooms dazzle you with their sumptuous furnishings, while the 22 hectare park outside is filled with woodland and exotic trees. Plus, the castle's unique location makes sunsets here a real treat. You can reach the castle by train or by catching the local buses 36 or 6, or for an impressive view on arrival, you can take a ferry boat and admire the castle in all its beauty from the sea. Now, the line is called Delfino Verde and it only operates during the summer months. Entrance to the castle is 10 euro, or it's free the first Sunday of each month and if you have an FVG card. Inhabited since the second millennia BC, Trieste developed with the Romans who founded a military settlement here in the first century BC to control the area and to push out the Celts and prevent invasions from barbarians on the other side of the Alps. The settlement was built on top of a hill, a strategic position chosen for its view of the area and coastline. Once safe, it became a Roman city and people began moving here from all around. There was a Roman basilica, a forum, which is a Roman version of a piazza or marketplace with shops, a temple and theatre. Now I say Roman basilica, but it's not a church like you might think of nowadays. A Roman basilica was a public building where officials met and did business and enforced the law. Now, many centuries later, these basilicas of the Roman Empire were used as architectural models when Christianity was introduced and churches were built. Later, the area of Trieste fell under Byzantine and Frankish rule. Then, in the 12th century, it became a free municipality. But when its autonomy was threatened, the city placed itself under the protection of Leopold III of Austria in 1382. This marked the beginning of its long relationship with the Habsburgs. Fast forward to 1719, the Habsburg Empire declared Trieste a free port and spared no expense in developing the city. After all, it was the only maritime gateway to its landlocked territories. During this time, Trieste blossomed as a key trading center, welcoming merchants and entrepreneurs from all around the Mediterranean, and soon the city became a favorite destination of artists. Until 1980, the Habsburg monarchy was one of the great powers of Europe, and Trieste was its most important seaport. 
At the beginning of the 20th century, Trieste became a major centre of the Irredentism movement, which sought to annex to Italy all the lands that were not included in the unified Italian kingdom, although historically Italian. After the fall of the Habsburg Empire with World War I and the end of the Nazi occupation following World War II, Trieste lived for a few years as an independent state under the protection of the UN, before being officially annexed to Italy in 1954. Today, this intricate patchwork of rulers, cultures and people that shape Trieste's history is everywhere you look. From its varied architectural styles to its multi-faith soul and a truly unique culinary identity. There's a little piece of ancient Rome right behind Piazza Unità d'Italia that history lovers won't want to miss. Teatro Romano di Trieste is a marvellous stone theatre dating back to the 1st century AD, when it was built as part of the development of the Roman colony of Tergeste under Emperor Trajan. Built in an area that was then by the sea, at the time it could sit up to 6,000 spectators. In the Middle Ages, it was hidden by the houses that were built over it. 2,000 years later, it was excavated and restored in 1938, and today is still the site of shows and artistic events. The location is quite scenic too, situated at the foot of the San Giusto Hill. It provided a natural setting for the amphitheatre. The structure, mostly made of masonry, is still in great shape, with the original stage and seating areas still visible along with a variety of columns. The original ornamental statues are on display at the Civic Museum of History and Art in the castle of San Giusto. On your way here, I highly recommend stopping by Gelato Marco for a refreshing break. It's only a few steps away and is one of the best gelatos you'll have in Trieste. Go there, come back here, sit on the park benches and enjoy this incredible view. <laughs> Standing high on a hill overlooking the Gulf of Trieste is Faro della Vittoria or Victory Lighthouse and this is a symbol of Trieste. At a height of 223 feet or 68 meters, it is one of the tallest lighthouses in the world. It's both graceful and formidable, matching the motivations for its erection. It was built in the 1920s to celebrate the inclusion of Trieste into the Kingdom of Italy after the long occupation by the Austrian Empire, but also to honour those who died at sea during World War I. The lighthouse is still working and is often open to visitors. The climb up to the viewing gallery, where I am now, is via some 300 steps, but there's also a lift which I highly recommend. Once at the top, you're rewarded with stunning panoramic views of the city and the coastline and the Gulf of Trieste. <music> While you're here, look out for the anchor at the base of the statue of the unknown seaman. It commemorates the historic entry of the first Italian ship into Trieste called Aldace, which translates to audacious. So where did the name of the city come from? Well, Trieste is derived from the ancient name Tergeste. Now, even though the Romans settled here, its name isn't entirely Latin. Instead, it gives us a clue to the pre-Roman origins of the city in the last phase of the local prehistory and to its economical importance. Now, one theory is that the place name Tergeste comes from ter, meaning three, and ergeste, meaning to build or erect, suggesting that the city was rebuilt three times. Another theory is that Tirk or TRG comes from the Slavic languages and means square or market, while este means city in the old Venetian language, Hence, together, it means market city. Nowadays, Trieste goes by many names. Città della Barcolana, which is a regatta. Città della Bora, referring to the northern Bora wind. Città del Vento, referring to that same wind. And Vienna by the sea, the city of coffee. These are all different ways, different expressions used to describe Trieste. To find out more about Trieste and the history of the city and the region itself, I highly recommend joining a private walking tour with Sonia. She's from Friuli and she's absolutely fabulous. For three hours, she'll take you around the city centre and really bring this place to life. To join her tour, I've shared a link in the description below this video. So, you know, 
Italy for its pizza, pasta, designer brands and iconic monuments like the Colosseum. But did you know that Italy has more than 35,000 caves? Now located on the Trieste Plateau or the Alto Piano Triestino, which covers an area of about 200 square kilometers or 77 square miles, there are 2,760 caves of various sizes on the Italian side of the border and 180 of them were used by prehistoric man. Now I say 180 on the Italian side because we're right near Slovenia. Now the most famous of these caves is Grotta Gigante, which means giant cave, a name which says it all. The cavity or main chamber is so big that it can fit St. Peter's Basilica in Rome inside. As one of the most important attractions and things to do in Trieste, this massive cast cave has been inhabited since the Neolithic era. To give you a sense of its size, the biggest chamber is 98.5 meters high, 167.6 meters long, and 76.3 meters wide. With these numbers, the Grotta Gigante made it into the Guinness World Book of Records as the world's largest tourist cave chamber until 2010, when it lost the title to Lascaux in France. The cave started forming around 10 million years ago when two rivers diverged and formed this giant cavity underground. Today you can visit this space by taking 500 steps down and follow a 167 meter pathway before winding up the other side via 500 more steps. During your visit, don't miss the cave's biggest stalagmite, which stands 12 meters tall and is 150,000 years old, and it is still active, meaning it's still growing at a Formula One pace of one millimeter every 10 to 15 years. As you take the steps leading back up, see if you can spot the original steel cable ladders and wooden steps. Discovered in the 1800s while searching for a solution to water shortages, the cave opened up to the public in 1908 and is now a true highlight of any trip to Trieste. Located in Borgo Grotta, it's just a 30 minute bus ride from the city centre of Trieste. It can only be visited as part of a guided tour, which lasts from an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. Make sure you book in advance to avoid disappointment. Tours run in Italian and in English and other languages upon request. Through a maze of alleys, there is a small square called Piazza del Barbican, and it's here that you'll find Arco di Riccardo, or Richard's Arch. This ancient arch seems to disappear into the modern building right next to it. The Arco di Riccardo is one of the most important monuments in Trieste. Made of white stone from the cave of Auricina, it stands around 7 metres high. Dating from the 1st century BC, the arch is said to be a Roman gate in the city walls when the Emperor Augusto established the Roman colony named Tergeste in Latin, a name which became Trieste in Italian. The gate was located along the main Roman way that connected the sea to the hills. The origins of its name are debated, but there are several prevalent theories. See which one you think is the right one. Now the Ricardo in the name might refer to the English King Richard I the Lionheart, who was said to have been captive in Trieste while on his way back north. Another theory is that it originates from the word Cardo, which was the name of one of the two main roads of the Roman settlement. And finally, some refer to the term Ricario, the name of a medieval courthouse that was located in the area. But the truth, I guess, we'll never know. Although it might sound surprising to most, Trieste is Italy's uncontested capital of coffee. During the Habsburg era in the mid-1800s, Trieste became a major coffee port of the Mediterranean and with a lot of roasteries popping up all over the city. Drinking coffee became a favoured pastime and contributed to shaping the city's identity. So much so that locals are said to drink nearly twice as much coffee on average as the rest of the country. During that time, an impressive amount of cafes were built, becoming a place for artists and intellectuals to socialize and find inspiration. Kafka, Freud, Severo all had their favorite cafe in Trieste. And it is said that James Joyce came up with the idea of Ulysses while drinking cappuccino in Trieste. Cafe San Marco, Cafe Torinese and Cafe degli Specchi are among the best coffee houses in Trieste to choose from. One important thing to note is that the locals use a specific coffee terminology that's unique to the city. The espresso in Trieste is called a nero, coffee with milk, which in Italian is macchiato, is called a capo, and the cappuccino is called a caffè latte. And if you want a decaffeinated espresso, it's called a capodeca. If you want to brush up on your Italian and learn how to order food and drink in Italian, check out my video, which I've linked in the description below this one.
nestled on a promontory overlooking the Gulf of Trieste, just north of the city, this beautiful historic residence predates Miramare Castle by about five centuries. Planted firmly on the last rock spur of the Carso, high above the Gulf of Trieste, Duino Castle is not just another stately home. An unusual case in Italy, and far more interesting, is that it is still the residence of the princely family of Torre and Tasso, who have played hosts to great artists and illustrious personalities over the years. These include Empress Sisi, Paul Valéry, Gabriele D'Annunzio and Reina Maria Rilke, who wrote some of his most famous lyrical poems here. Despite the devastation of the First World War and the depredations of the Second, the castle still boasts artistic masterpieces and rare historical relics. And overlooking the vast horizons of the sea are its gardens, with their romantic avenues embellished with period statues and objects and panoramic terraces. The owners have decided to open the gardens and most of their castle home to the public for tours, conferences, concerts, gala dinners and other events. Set out on a number of levels, the gardens display multicoloured beds and cascades of all types of flowers, forming attractive splashes of colour amid the classical Mediterranean vegetation and acting as a backdrop for a wealth of status and an old well decorated with the family coat of arms. The castle itself is a solid composite with constructions dominated by the 16th century tower which holds intact a structure whose origins go back 2000 years. There's even a commemorative stone placed there in the 3rd century to mark a visit by the Emperor Diocletian. It was around this tower, on the ruins of a Roman military outpost, that building started on the present castle in the 14th century. Its location was not far from that of its ancient forerunner, which is traditionally thought to have been dedicated to the worship of the sun god and has been given the romantic name the White Lady. There are about 20 rooms to visit filled with precious artworks and period pieces. The visit also includes the bunker that the Germans built when they occupied the castle during World War II. Also while you're here, don't miss taking a panoramic walk along the Rilke Trail. Named after the great German poet, it's a stunning two kilometer coastal path that connects the castle to the Bay of Sistiana. To get here, it takes about a 40 minute bus ride from the city centre of Trieste, but you can also visit this place as part of a guided tour as well as the Grotta Gigante, and I've shared a link to that tour in the description below this video. <music> Città della Bora, or City of Wind. And this is what I have to deal with, creating videos like this for you guys. <laughs> This is the Grand Canal of Trieste, and while it might not be as grand as the one in Venice, it's certainly worth more than just a look while you're in town. It's located near Piazza Unita d'Italia, in the heart of the historic town, where it was built in the mid-1700s so that boats could unload their cargo directly into the city. This spot is absolutely stunning. It has cute little boats moored at both sides, and it is surrounded by elegant buildings with the Serbian Orthodox Church of St. Spiridon peeking out. It's one of the most photogenic places in Trieste. Additionally, it hosts various events all year long, including Christmas markets. One of the bridges that cross the Grand Canal is actually dedicated to James Joyce. And just further on, you'll find a statue of him. He lived here in 1904 to 1915 and absolutely loved this area. The Orthodox Serbian community is well integrated in the city and has contributed to its growth since the 18th century when merchants and ship owners arrived, attracted by the city's role as the main commercial harbour in Austria. The church was built in the second half of the 19th century after Empress Maria Teresa granted them the right to establish their own religious community. Today it's one of the best places to see Trieste to learn more about the local Orthodox Serbian community, which is the largest in Italy. It boasts all the distinctive architectural traits of eastern churches, with interiors covered in beautiful frescoes and glittering mosaics. While you're here, listen out for the Vesper Chants, which are performed by the church's 24-member choir. It's pure magic. Not many people know that Trieste used to have its own stock exchange market, as testified by the stunning Palazzo on Piazza della Borsa, that once hosted the activities of the stock market traders. During the 19th century, this square served as the city's economic centre. 
Today it's an elegant pedestrianised area with fine examples of neoclassical architecture. Piazza della Borsa is a great place to shop and to meet up with friends. There are lots of restaurants and boutiques and sometimes small fairs and markets are held here. In the centre of the piazza stands Neptune's fountain, once used by locals for washing clothes. Among the palaces that line Piazza della Borsa, don't miss Casa Bartoli. This is the most famous Liberty-style building in Trieste. It is also known as the Green House due to the colour of the floral decorations on the main facade. A dazzling sight in Trieste is Piazza dell'Unità d'Italia, the city's main square. On one side it opens up onto the Adriatic Sea and is located just a few steps from Piazza della Borsa. Originally called Piazza San Pietro after a church that was located here, it was remodelled and renamed several times before getting its current name in 1955, following the city's annexation to Italy. The piazza showcases a striking mix of prestigious buildings. There's the city hall with its beautiful clock tower, topped by statues of two moors and the Palace of the Government with its Art Nouveau facade. Also, don't miss Palazzo del Loi Trestino, a shipping line founded in 1836, and the Grand Hotel Duce d'Aosta that could be straight out of a Wes Anderson film. The piazza is of historical importance for a more sombre reason. On the 18th of September 1938, from the balcony of City Hall, Benito Mussolini announced that the promulgation of racial rules against Judaism was imminent in Italy and that segregation would begin. Overlooking the city from the top of San Giusto Hill is Castello di San Giusto or San Giusto Castle and it deserves a spot on a list of best things to do in Trieste thanks to its history and collections. It was built by the Habsburgs between the 15th and 17th centuries with interventions by the Republic of Venice when it gained rule over Trieste in the early 16th century. After a scenic entrance via a wooden drawbridge you can explore its beautiful vaulted halls and climb up the ramparts for some of the best views of Trieste and its gulf. There are also museum displays with ancient weapons, rich tapestries and statues from the Roman amphitheatre from where I'm standing now. On your way up to the castle make sure you stop at Piazza San Silvestro to admire the beautiful Baroque interior of the 17th century church Santa Maria Maggiore. <music> Next to the castle, the Cathedral of San Giusto is Trieste's most important religious building. Its current look comes from the aggregation of two churches that date from the 14th century and the result is architecturally impressive. There's a beautiful gothic rose window adorning the brick facade while the statue of San Giusto stands above the entrance to the bell tower. The interior features beautiful mosaics dating from the 12th and 13th centuries and frescoes depicting stories of the saint. You can also see traces of the 5th century mosaic floor, while the cathedral bell was cast by a cannon bell left by Napoleon. During a visit, don't miss climbing the bell tower for great views of Trieste and close-ups of five enormous bells that toll the hours. Stand on the steps of giants at Scala dei Giganti, aka the Giant Stairway. Located between Piazza Goldoni and Via del Monte, Scala dei Giganti is a steep and stately stairway that connects the heart of Trieste with the archaeological site of San Giusto Hill. Built in 1970, the Scala dei Giganti was designed by the Berlums, a well-known Triestine family of architects. Built in a neoclassical style, it features a double stairway, niches and statues, and a large fountain at the top. From here, it frames a wonderful view over the city of Trieste. Art lovers should seek out Revoltella Civic Museum, one of Italy's major modern art galleries. Housed in three beautiful palazzi, its collection features over a thousand paintings and several hundred sculptures, prints and drawings from the mid-1800s to the modernist era. The majority of the collection, as well as one of the buildings occupied by the museum, were bequeathed to the city by Pasquale Revoltella, an entrepreneur who played a crucial role in the opening of the Suez Canal. Artists that are showcased in its 40 rooms include Mario Sirone, Francesco Hayes, Lucio Fontane and Giorgio De Chirico.
During a visit, don't miss the museum's rooftop terrace where I'm standing now, which is open for the public to see the incredible harbour views. And in the evenings from 7pm onwards, there's even a bar here, so you can watch the views as the sun goes down with a cocktail in hand. It's time to explore a more gloomy chapter of the local history at Risiera di San Sabba. Now being a border territory, Trieste had its fair share of dark moments, but the worst came with the Nazi occupation in 1943 to 1945. The prime testimony of the horrors the city experienced in those years is here at Risiera di San Sabba, a former rice husking factory, hence the name Risiera in Italian, that turned into a concentration camp during World War II. The Nazi regime killed an estimated 3,000 political prisoners here and thousands more were deported to larger concentration camps, mainly Auschwitz. In Italy there were only two concentration camps, Trieste was the only one with a crematorium. In the 1970s it became a civic museum with a permanent exhibition about the Nazi crimes in the region. In this space where I'm standing now, this is called La Sala delle Croci, or Hall of Crosses, thanks to the wooden beams. Now, originally there were three floors. On the third floor lived Jewish prisoners that were later deported to Germany. On the second floor were political suspects, and on the ground floor there were those who worked as tailors and cobblers. On a more personal note, this is the first time I've ever visited a concentration camp, and it's definitely given me an uneasy feeling, and one that I experienced as soon as I arrived. The energy here is quite overwhelming, and I've had to take a moment to myself. Now, I think it's important that everyone visits a historical monument such as this. It definitely makes all those history lessons at school more tangible and deepens one's awareness of what actually happened. It's hard to imagine that all this was going on in just the lifetime of our grandparents, so not that long ago. Visiting Risiera di San Sabbe is free and is located just 20 minutes south of the city via a bus ride. If you'd like to learn more about the Nazi occupation here, the local tourism board organises monthly tours of Little Berlin, a network of underground shelters built by the Nazis to protect themselves from bombing raids. As a result of its thriving port, over the centuries Trieste was a crossroads of cultures and people, something that can still be seen today in the numerous religious buildings of different faiths dotting the city centre. One of them is the Jewish synagogue that opened in 1912. The Jewish community in Trieste has roots in the 13th century, but most arrived in the city during the Empire period, engaging in trade and banking. This grand synagogue is the second largest Jewish temple in Europe, after the one in Budapest. But there's a question of which one is the biggest, because by volume, the one in Budapest is bigger, but it only holds 1,200 people, while this one here holds 1,500. You can visit the synagogue as part of a 60 to 90 minute guided tour where you'll learn all about the history of the Jewish community in Trieste from the Middle Ages all the way up to present day. To join a tour, booking is essential and can be organised via the Trieste Ebraica website which I've linked to in the description below this video. Dobre utro, that's good morning in Slovenian. But why am I speaking Slovenian in Italy? Well, that's because I'm here at Lake Bled in Slovenia. If you have extra time during your visit to Trieste, I definitely recommend taking a guided day trip to Lake Bled and Ljubljana, Slovenia's capital. If you go by public transport, it will take you about five hours just to reach the lake, or two and a half hours to reach the capital. On this tour, it takes just over an hour to reach your first stop, which is this stunning Lake Bled, with a small island floating in the middle. Called Bled Island, this island has several buildings, the main one being the Pilgrimage Church dedicated to the Assumption of Mary, built in its current form near the end of the 17th century. This church frequently hosts weddings. Traditionally, it is considered good luck for the groom to carry his bride up the steps on the day of their wedding, before ringing the bell and making a wish inside the church. The traditional transportation to Blade Island is a wooden boat known as Pletna. The word Pletna is borrowed from Bavarian German, Platten, meaning flat-bottomed boat. The role of the oarsmen dates back to 1740, 
when Maria Teresa of Austria granted 22 local families exclusive rights to ferry religious pilgrims across Lake Bled to worship on Bled Island. The profession is still restricted. Many modern oarsmen descend directly from the original 22 families. While you're here, you have to try the area's culinary specialty, a cream pastry called Kremschnitta, which was designated a protected dish of designated origin in 2016 by the Slovenian government. To book the same guided tour as I did, I've shared a link in the description below this video so you can check availability and book your tour. So how do you visit Trieste and travel around the region? Well, Trieste Airport is about 35 kilometers from the city and offers direct connections to 14 destinations in Italy and Europe, including Rome, London and Frankfurt. Travelling by train is a great alternative with daily high-speed connections to main Italian cities through Trenitalia and Italo. Trenitalia also has trains running between Trieste and Ljubljana. As for cars, while it's true they allow you to maximise your time, you also have to be aware of the numerous limited traffic zones, or ZTL, which are located in the city. Trieste is best explored on foot and it's pretty compact and easy to navigate. Plus, most of the top sites are within easy walking distance. There's a convenient bus network with single tickets starting at €1.35 and a daily ticket for €3. Euros. Bikes can be rented through the city's handy bike sharing scheme with rides under 30 minutes being free. And finally, a ferry service ensures connections within the Gulf of Trieste. Today, the dominant local dialect of Trieste is Triestine, which is a form of the Venetian language. This dialect and standard Italian are spoken in the city, while Slovene is spoken in some of the immediate suburbs. There are also small numbers of Serbian, Croatian, German, Greek and Hungarian speakers. Many words in Triestine are taken from other languages. As Trieste borders with Slovenia and was under the Habsburg monarchy for almost six centuries, many of the words are of German and Slovene origin. Due to the extensive emigration of this city in the late 18th and 19th century, many words come from other languages such as Greek and Serbo-Croatian. When visiting a foreign country, it's a nice gesture and a sign of respect to learn a handful of pleasantries to use when speaking with the locals. So here are five essential Italian phrases to learn before you visit Italy and indeed Trieste. The first one is ciao and salve. Both of these mean hello. Ciao and salve. The second one is arrivederci. Now this means goodbye. Literally it means until we see each other again. Repeat after me. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. The third one is grazie, which means thank you. Remember to pronounce the I-E ending. Grazie. Grazie. The fourth one is mi scusi and permesso, both of which mean excuse me, but are used in different contexts. Mi scusi is used when you want to get someone's attention or to apologize for something small like bumping into someone. And permesso is used to get past someone. Think of it like asking for permission. So we have mi scusi and permesso, and you can use it as a question, permesso. The fifth one is per favore, literally for a favor. This is how you say please in Italian, per favore. Got a trip coming up or want to communicate with your Italian relatives? Now you can learn Italian with my unique 80-20 method. Just click on the link in the description below this video to check out my online video language courses that will help you become the conversational in Italian. Join over 700 students for lifetime access and learn anywhere, anytime and on any device. Allora, eccoci qua. So there we have it. This is my guide on the best things to do in Trieste. If you have any questions, just pop them in the comments below and I'll get back to you. And don't forget to find links to my Trieste travel guide and links on all tours in the description below this video. In the meantime, hit that like button, subscribe to my channel and turn on those notifications so you get an alert when I post more videos like this one. Until next time, thanks for watching, happy language learning and buon viaggio. Have a great trip. Ciao.